Ato Nabo TV. Ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, thank you for attending today. Uh, I'm here to introduce you uh, to um, a small school named Scuola Nova. Um, Scuola Nova is uh, located in an idyllic setting in the countryside of an even smaller country named Belgium. Hello. Uh, the school was founded about 20 years ago, starting with only three students. Nowadays, there are about 70 students from elementary school to high school and about 150 alumni. The school's philosophy is secular. People from all religions and creeds, or lack thereof, are all welcome. And uh, I myself am a, proud al am a proud alumnus of the school. I spent uh, two formative years there uh, at age 12 and 13. Now, why should we be interested in a small European school located about 4,000 miles away? What can be learned about their particular experience? First of all, what started as a small scale private project didn't end up as just another private school, albeit with more classics and humanities. At Scuola Nova, we speak Latin. Let me start with a few words about the school's history and provide a bit of context. The school was founded in the mid 1990s by this man, Stefan Fay, a former music teacher and conductor. When Stefan's oldest daughter, a brilliant student, started attending high school, he got worried. Taking a closer look at the curriculum, he was thinking to himself, is this going to be it? He wanted her to have at least the same minimum of education he enjoyed being young. And he realized what stood at the basis of it all, Latin. Now, to put the record straight, we don't have exactly have a lack of uh, Latin instruction in Belgium. With a population of a mere 11 million, <laughs> around 55,000 students study Latin. Uh, at middle and high school level, and quite a lot of those study it during the entire six years, ranging from K-7 till K-12. Now, by comparison, there are about 130,000 um, American high school students who study Latin, roughly the double, but uh, your population exceeds our 30-fold. Uh, it is also important to stress that in Belgium, learning Latin or ancient Greek as uh, the matter of fact, is not restricted to a social elite. More than half of state schools offer Latin courses. The main problem is, of course, that it is taught as a dead language. Another problem is that the teachers are obliged to follow a very narrowly defined program, dispossessing them of the autonomy to handle the subject creatively. But let me go back to Scuola Nova's founder, Stefan Fay, and his dilemma regarding his daughter's education. What would you do if you'd find yourself confronted to a problem like that? You'd start your own school, of course, from scratch. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> which father wouldn't do that for his children? As I told earlier, uh, Stefan quickly realized that Latin would have to be a major cornerstone, uh, cornerstone for this new undertaking. He thought, wouldn't it be great if the students would learn Latin properly to be able to read the ancient text in their original language? As a matter of fact, a historic inspiration could be found close. Scola is situated a few miles from Leuven, home to the Catholic University of Leuven, founded in the 15th century. In 1517, a year before our friend Luther was busy nailing his thesis to uh, the Wittenberg church door, the humanist Hieronymus Buslidius established a very special institution over there, the Collegium Trilingue. Influenced by his friend Erasmus of Rotterdam, the idea was to spread the revival of the classics by teaching the three ancient languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. The Collegium Trilingue is itself also an inspiration of the renowned Collège de France, but that's another story. Equally important is the fact that the Bible and classics were not approached through commentaries and prolegomena, but rather directly at fontes, as was, Erasm uh, as was Erasmus's adage. During the first year of, Scuola's new, uh, of Scuola Nova's existence, Stefan, almost by accident, heard of a living Latin circle in Brussels. Those were a small group of passionate amateurs and academics, mainly from the University of Leuven, who would gather once a week to speak Latin together. The group was quite international. Regular visitors included Terence Stumberg, who's also present at this conference, 
Um, back then, he was a uh, visiting professor in Belgium. And uh, another frequent guest was uh, Kalestis Eikenseer. Some of you may know him uh, as the founder of Vox Latina. Uh, the Circle is also known for publishing uh, Melissa, uh, the only Latin journal that is published uh, two times uh, every two months, if I'm uh, not mistaken. So uh, Stefan decided to pay that group of eccentrics a little visit. After just one session, uh, to his surprise, they weren't just trying to speak Latin, they were actually speaking it fluently. After just one session, he had learned more Latin than an entire week of Latin reading. He came back, bringing other Scola Nova teachers along. About a year later, they were all speaking and reading the ancient language with relative ease. Naturally, they thought, if we can learn it, so can our students. They took it up notch and spent a few weeks at the Vivarium Novum, an academy in Italy founded by Luigi Miralia, that's him, where all classes are taught in Latin and ancient Greek exclusively. Slowly but surely, Stefan and his colleagues introduced living Latin while giving some of their, classics, uh, some of their classes at Scuola Nova. They mainly used two didactic methods. First, Hans Urbeck's Lingua Latina per se illustrata, uh, that most of you will know, and secondly, Asimil. Now, um, Asimil is a method by which students learn a language through small progressive dialogues and uh, tape recordings in order to assimilate the content, nomen est omen. In grade seven and grade eight, the students have respectively nine hours and seven hours of Latin a week, um, in <coughs> more of half of which is taught in living Latin. Uh, this is the handbook, uh, this is the textbook, uh, Lingua Latina per se illustrata. Um, now, when we finish this course uh, and we get to grade nine, we start reading our first authors. Now, how do we read our classics? Traditionally, in most high schools, the students' staple fare is drawn from Caesar's Gallic Wars in Latin and Xenophon's Anabasis in Greek. Those texts have formed the, cor uh, the cornerstone of the classics curriculum ever since the Jesuits. Um, now, they are, of course, interesting uh, to philologists, but they tend to be pretty tedious and dull to normal Latin students. I don't find them that dull, but I might be the exception that confirms the rule. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's where I'm going to get. <laughs> now, at Scuola Nova, uh, the school being private, the teachers don't have to follow a strict curriculum. They can pick out any text they want to read, tolle et lege, as St. Augustine said. Students are also free to give suggestions. That in turn gives them the liberating sense of commitment and autonomy. For teenagers, Seneca's letters, Petronius, Catullus and Apuleius are far more interesting and much more fun to read than Caesar. The same counts for Greek. The Anabasis might be a classic school text, Thalassa, Thalassa, all of us know it, who have studied Greek at high school, but the Cyropedia might be much more interesting. Now, although Latin as a vernacular language died out in the early Middle Ages, it remained the lingua franca of academia until fairly recently. This includes, of course, the grand pubas of uh, the Renaissance, like Petrarca, Moore, and Erasmus, but also Newton, Volta, Gauss, Schopenhauer, Marx, and Nietzsche. Latin speakers are often asked, how do you express yourself in mo about modern things, like electricity in Latin? But they don't realize that sometimes the term existed in Latin before it did in English. Um, William Gilbert, an uh, English physicist, developed the term electricus from the Greek electron, amber, referring to the static electricity it releases after being rubbed. Even Alessandro Volta, the inventor of the battery, wrote in Latin. Being able to read the text as a student after a few years of Latin opens your, eye, open your, opens your eyes and alters your view on your own history. Obviously, some of our students go on to study humanities. For them, being able to read literature, linguistics, and history and their sources in their original language is a great advantage. But the same is also true for lawyers, mathematicians, scientists, and psychologists since many academic papers in those fields were written in Latin until the beginning of the century. The school also teaches a history course on the Middle Ages in Latin, usually given by an alumnus from the Vivarium Novum Academy who learns French in exchange for lessons. 
instead of focusing on a few texts, Scola tries to offer a wide overview of Latin authors, broadening the student's scope tremendously along the way. So, from the student's point of view, what are the advantages of learning living Latin at school? First of all, it's fun. And teens like to have fun, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> that simple fact is so often overlooked. The sheer pleasure of being able to speak Latin as a normal language is so much more rewarding than rote learning of declensions. It gives back the love of letters to philology, if you ask me. Of course, it's fun to have fun, but you also learn a lot better when you're having fun. It also connects people. A few years back, we exchanged students with the Museum Graeco Latinum, an associated school in Moscow. Obviously, most of the communication was in Latin. We can focus on the text instead of spending all our time looking, up and looking them up in a dictionary. And those texts are darn interesting. <laughs> Scola gives its students the know-how to continue reading Latin texts after graduation, a tool to put th to use throughout their lives. There is more to a good education to Latin, of course. At Scuola Nova, the sciences are well established as well. A demanding course of mathematics, as well as biology, chemistry, and physics, make an integral part of the curriculum. We have a very good French course, with a focus on grammar and syntax in K7. In K8, 9, and 10, we go on with a chronological literature course. And in K11, we have a special class focused on rhetoric. For the English and Dutch classes, the students are divided according to their level. The most advanced students follow immersion classes in art history or geography. And those classes are always taught by native speakers. The history course is progressive and chronological. Ancient, that is Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Greek history in K7. Roman history in K8. Medieval history in K9, taught in Latin, as I said before, by student of the Vivarium. Modern history in K10, and contemporary history in, t in K11. The entire course has been written by a very dedicated teacher, Hans van Kastel, who also teaches the Greek course. In Latin, of course. The school is private, but uh, the fees have been kept a strict m to a strict minimum. There is, a fin there is financial help available under the form of grants. No student has ever been rejected because of financial reasons. Now, in order to keep the teaching as broad as possible, the school makes its own curriculum and doesn't follow the official curriculum of the Ministry of Education. At the end of their studies, our students pass a state exam to get a degree. Many students also engage in extracurricular activities. Most popular is music. We have a wonderful concert hall where students can learn music theory, piano, violin, or cello at all levels. All of this is for free. We also have a wonderful choir in which I myself participated. It is led by an extraordinary teacher called Tinuke, who studied at the National Opera Studio in London. As a matter of fact, many teachers and students at Scuola Nova have pursued careers in music. Stefan was a teacher of music. His son started the, the Quatuor Fe, which regularly performs at Scuola Nova. At the end of every trimester, students perform their best musical words in, uh, works in public. Scuola also provides cla uh, theater classes. Every year, students stage an either a piece written by Hans van Kastel, our Greek teacher, or a classical piece. And on Fridays, there are painting and sculpture lessons as well. But let's go back to the dead languages. Scuola also offers courses in uh, the evening, open to everybody. You can learn classical or, uh, Arabic, Hebrew, ancient Egyptian, and most exotically, English. <laughs> you could almost say that on top of being a school, Scuola Nova functions as a small cultural center as well. As a result, the school is a very enriching environment in which students are constantly exposed to culture. Latin and Greek humanities are a compass to explore culture in all its forms. Since Scuola's foundation 20 years ago, alumni have become engineers, biologists, doctors, bankers, lawyers, refuting the claim that classical humanities only educate philologists. Although some, including myself, are happily walking down that path. Um, at the University of Louvain-la-Neuve, some Scola alumni studying classics started a very interesting project. They decided to create their own Latin dorm. All communication within the building is conducted in Latin or ancient Greek, if you're into that. And, uh, <laughs> mo <laughs> and most of the students go to the Vivarium Novum Academy once a year to bolster their Latin. 
It is called the Insula Latina, a play of word. Insula meaning both island, referring to the island of the Utopia, and the apartment building in which the community lives. Once a month, they, they organize a Kena Latina, a spoken Latin dinner that teachers and students often attend. But Scola, on a, modest, on a modest but significant scale, has also sparked a Latin movement beyond Belgium's borders. Meet my friend and roommate, Abel Schutte. He is from Amsterdam, studied at Scola Nova with his sister Eline, and then went on to study at the Vivarium Novum. Like from Italy in 2012, he decided to carry on the flame. At first, he and Aldo Toledo, uh, our teacher of medieval history at Scola Nova at the time, taught living Latin lessons to interested high school teachers in Amsterdam. Quickly, a small circle was formed. Teachers from different levels learned the basis of living Latin in a few months. The Ateneum Illustre was born. It was named after the illustrious school of Amsterdam, a liberal arts college founded by the humanists Parleus and Vossius that later morphed into the University of Amsterdam. Latin was the sole language of education until 1877 at the original college, but later the teaching language switched to Dutch. Papers and theses could be written in Latin as late as the 1950s. In 2013 was the year of the first Dies Latini conference. Abo and other Latin speakers, among them Maria Luisa Aguiar and Jorge Tarrega, also present as speakers uh, here in New York, gave living Latin demonstrations in several high schools to introduce the method to curious high school teachers and students alike. They then organized a Latin conference, not unlike our very own living Latin in New York City, with Latin-speaking academics and teachers from all over Europe. The conference was a resounding success. Enthusiastic teachers reached out in turn to others locally, such as Casper Porton, who even started his own summer course, Adisco. There have been four conferences since, all very successful, and as a result, almost 20 Dutch schools now use the Urbic method of living Latin in just five years' time. The first class of students that was taught spoken Latin will graduate this year, at the, end of at the end of which they will have to take a test that is quite similar to the American AP. If the results are good, which mock tests predict, more are bound to follow. So why does all of this matter? Today, our field, and humanities in general, have come under fire. We always feel the need to justify ourselves and we justify ourselves in the face of utilitarianism with utilitarian arguments. We say that Latin comes in handy to learn grammar and widen our vocab. It helps to learn new languages and it improves our logical thinking, a valuable skill that uh, employers like. But all of this, okay, it is true of course, but those arguments miss the point somehow. Learning Latin enables you to directly tap into this vast continent of literature ranging from antiquity until yesterday. It gives you the possibility to engage with the authors on your own terms in order to try to understand the world more thoroughly and become a better person every year in the process. But this argument is difficult to maintain if people who have studied Latin intensively for several years cannot read a simple Latin text without struggling for hours to dictionaries and grammars. This is why spoken Latin is our best tool to promote the classics in high school or at the university level, as Professor Daniel Gallagher does at Cornell. The living, uh, the living method is the only method that really empowers students of Latin. Within a few years, it enables them to have direct and unadulter un unadulterated access to any text they want to read. As you know, the great majority of ancient texts haven't been translated yet. To quote Professor Rico, it is as you would be given the key to the Library of Alexandria and be able to, peek, to pick any text you wanted and start reading it on the spot. The analogy works better in Greek, of course, but you get the picture. As a student of living Latin, where you end up professionally doesn't matter in the end. Be it in academia, science, engineering, history, medicine, or something entirely different, you'll be able to cultivate yourself throughout your entire life. It is more urgent than ever to be able to connect with the past to try to make sense of the present and anticipate the future. I'm fully of hope for the future, but I do sense that a form of dystopia is growing day by day. Culture, literature especially, enables you to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, to experience a million things and live hundreds of, life, 
uh, lives beyond space and time. This helps generating a sense of empathy. Empathy is also more than ever under attack. If we lose it entirely, we might as well give up. The sooner you are immersed in a place of culture, the better. Scuola Nova has been such a place for me. It changed my young life and has shaped me in ways that I'm not yet fully aware of. As a principle, Aristotle thought us that for every motion, there is a mover. For me personally, Scuola Nova was the mover that set me off on a fantastic ongoing journey. Scuola Nova broadened my horizon so much that I have been accepted at the Vivarium Novum at a very young age. This in turn enabled me to return to complete my high school studies where I left them off at the Jesuit College St. Jan Bergmans in Brussels. I went back there as a more mature young man, in peace with myself at last, having found my way and a sense of purpose. <coughs> this gave me the confidence to contact Jason Pedicone, president of the Paideia Institute, organizer of this conference. Jason and his colleague Eric Hewitt gave me my first real break. Uh, took, me as, um, took me on as an intern in Rome and entrusted me with great projects to handle independently. In a nutshell, without Scuola Nova and all the wonderful people who have helped me along the way thereafter, I wouldn't have the immense privilege to have tested your patience here today in the Magnum Malum, the Big Apple. Thank you. Yeah.